the second session of the 2022 Ohio State University Extension Beef Team's Virtual Beef School was hosted via Zoom on February 23rd. During that second session, the focus was squarely on the weather and climate, including recent trends, speculation on what our weather in the coming years might look like, how the performance of our cattle are impacted by the mud we've experienced in recent winters, and considerations for managing those weather-related performance concerns. Featured speakers for the evening were Dr. Aaron Wilson, who serves as the OSU Extension Climatologist, and OSU Animal Sciences PhD candidate, Kirsten Nichols. Listen in as OSU Extension Beef Specialist, Garth Ruff, introduces the evening's program. Uh, so with us tonight is Dr. Aaron Wilson, our state extension climatologist. He's gonna talk to us about weather and climate, um, maybe get to a little bit of weather outlook uh, if time permits. Uh, and then we're going to follow that up with the presentation on how mud really impacts um, the cow-calf operation. Uh, you know, we've all had cows certainly standing in mud during gestation. Uh, and if you got cows that are calving here in the next 30, 60 days, you're going to have cows and calves standing in mud as well. Um, so soon to be Dr. Kirsten Nichols is going to talk, talk to us about that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Wilson. He's gonna to talk to us about climate and weather. All right, thank you, Garth. And uh, certainly it's good to be with everyone tonight. So uh, that should say 2022 OSU beef team. I'm already two years behind apparently, but no, uh, it's great to be uh, here tonight talking about uh, weather and climate. We'll, we'll span the gamut. You know, we'll talk about weather, we'll talk about climate, we'll talk about long-term and short-term. Um, and, and I do wanna to get to that forecast uh, and projection for upcoming spring um, before we get to the end of today's presentation. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So, you know, obviously I, I, I like to always start out with a little bit of talk about weather and climate and kind of the differences here first. Um, you know, weather is constant is in constant motion. We know that our temperatures go up a lot every day and down every day for the most part, unless there's clouds out there or it's winter time. Uh, but those temperature changes and wind speed and moisture you know, things are constantly moving across the surface of the earth. And this is an animation uh, showing wildfire smoke, sea salt, and dust as it moves across the surface of the portion of the northern hemisphere. Uh, some of the tropical systems, this is Hurricane Harvey, by the way, from 2017, when it dropped 65 inches of, of rain in four days in Beaumont, Port Arthur. Uh, but, but you've got constant motion. And, and over time, you know, these weather patterns, obviously you see these tropical systems moving from east to west, and then as they get close to the United States, they start to curve and then move west to east. And we know our weather moves primarily from west to east, and we get frequented by wildfire smoke from the west, just like we did this past summer. Over time, these weather patterns, these long-term weather patterns, establish conditions that we would expect. So the weather patterns establish uh, what we, you know, our typical high today, which is right around, you know, the low 40s, maybe mid 40s for Southern Ohio, well above that today, obviously 15, 20 degrees above that today, um, we can have these extremes on a day to day basis. Now, when we think about climate, we're really thinking about we're out walking our dog a little bit. So imagine you're, you, you have a dog, you're out walking the dog, and that dog is driven by some um, natural tendencies, right? It, it wants to, you know, visit a fire hydrant. My daughters like to talk about dropping a little pee mail, uh, maybe a, a, a McDonald's wrapper or, or something like that. That dog can be moving in the opposite direction that you're moving. Um, and, um, oh, sorry, uh, that dog can be moving in the opposite direction you're moving, but you see where the finger's pointing. We expect it to be there uh, both of you in a couple of minutes. And that's based on the path that we see the dog walker taken. So we like to think of the dog as our weather and the dog walker as the climate. Even though that dog can meander back and forth, the, the weather is seemingly chaotic. Uh, that mean path can be described by the dog walker's path. So you can have record high days in a cold season or record cold days in a, in a warm season. That's how those two are, are related. So think to yourself a little bit. I like to, I always like to do this. And if we're face to face, we can do more um, interaction. But was 2021 warmer or cooler than average? So think about last season before we start thinking about this season a little bit. And if you said warmer than average, it was pretty good chance 
um, in Ohio, you saw warmer than average conditions. So we see the average, the, the annual, the average on the left, and it's the departures uh, from the mean, uh, the long-term mean, 1991 to 2020. A lot of the oranges indicating one to three, maybe upwards of four degrees above average for the year. Uh, highs, just our daytime highs in the middle, still above average for the most part. And then overnight lows, much more of the state covered by warmer than average overnight lows. And so it was the fifth warmest year on record for the state of Ohio back to 1895. But we don't live weather like this. This is, this is more the dog walker, it's not the dog. So let's zoom in. I'm gonna zoom in here in Northern Washington County. I don't get to do that often actually. So I figured uh, let, let's visit the Southeastern portion of the state a little bit and take a look at the uh, the the, uh, the da daily temperatures, the highs and lows here in gray, um, which are showing your daytime high and your daytime low. So that's the daily range. Red, dark red is the, the record for that day. Dark blue is the record low for that, that, that day as well. And so this allows us to, to visit the, the variability. So last year we had a glancing polar vortex blow uh, in February. Most of it stayed out west of us in Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, but we had a little bit of uh, extreme cold air here in February. Then we got out of the gate really quick, very warm conditions in March. We'll talk about why that was a little bit. Then we saw near record cold, right? So we had very cold conditions in April and May, followed by a pretty mild summer. And then we got late summer into fall. And a lot of our overnight lows were actually close to our, our daytime highs, our normal daytime highs here. Uh, so exceptional warmth through much of the fall except for November, November was chilly, and then we bounced right back up to a very warm December as well. Um, was, it tw was 2021 wetter or drier than average? Now this is a little bit trickier, right? We know that it can vary quite a bit uh, just across the county. And so again, uh, if you look at the whole state, we saw anywhere from 30 to 50 inches or so, uh, a little bit more than 50 inches in a couple counties in, in South Central Ohio. The darker blues are a little bit on the light side. It was the 29th wettest year on record for the state of Ohio. That's 127 year record again. Generally, the western half of the state was wetter than average, drier than average in the, on the right-hand side, uh, as you can see the, the, um, the middle figure and the figure on the right. So the eastern counties were a bit below average, western counties were above average. But again, we didn't really experience it uh, this way. We experienced it in, in daily rainfall. So again, if we zoom into Northern Washington County here and we look at the daily rainfall for the year, uh, you know, we, we typically see our, our greatest rainfall during the summer. Uh, we have actually at this station got our heaviest uh, rainfall in August. Uh, but if we look, you know, we don't have a dry season, wet season per se, it's pretty, pretty distributed. Uh, and especially last year at this location, uh, very few days of extreme precipitation, which was a little bit different than a lot of places around the state. Uh, but in four days, about 14% of that rainfall fell. 40.69 inches for uh, Northern Washington County is a bit below average uh, for the year. Again, we had that glancing blow from the polar vortex focused there out in the middle part of the country. These are state rankings. So the, the ranking of the coldest Februarys for the whole 127 year record. A lot of cold out there. Overall, winter was pretty average to slightly below average, despite that 27th coldest February. Something we had last year that we have not seen a lot of over the last decade is, is a fairly dry winter. We had the 23rd driest winter for the state. So you can see much of uh, the state, except for Southern Lawrence and Gallia counties, um, were, below, were below average. So uh, anywhere from 50 to, to about 80, 90% of average uh, for the winter last year. Again, 23rd driest winter on record, and that would continue into spring as well. Now, one thing we saw in spring, and I like to make this note whenever it happens, is what it looks like, the difference between what we experience and what the, you know, uh, the climate statistics will tell us about last spring. So if we think about it, um, dry conditions in the winter, early spring, most of spring actually, led to a very warm start. You know, dry soils really help the air warm up fast because all that energy is not going into evaporating the moisture from the surface. So we had a very warm March. We had some atmospheric variability that led to a cold, cold May. So even though it was the 12th warmest March and the 47th coldest spring, I can tell you that if you take the warm March and you add a cold May and you divide by two, guess what? You had an average spring. Right. So 
statistically, climate statistics, it was a fairly average mild spring, uh, even though we know we had a lot of variability and big swings in our temperatures throughout the season. Again, something we hadn't seen since 2013 was a very dry spring, 34th driest spring on record. We were actually a little bit concerned uh, from a drought perspective at the end of April, we had 70% of the state covered in abnormally dry conditions and 22% of the state in moderate drought conditions. Uh, we were a little bit worried as we were heading into May and June, uh, but ultimately the very timely rains for much of the state did arrive by the time we got to June, July and, and beyond. Something last summer that I, I do wanna bring up and, and, and is you know, impactful in a way, both good and bad, uh, last July, our daytime highs, which I'm showing you here in the middle, were actually cooler than average, while our overnight lows on the right-hand side were near to above average, um, which, which may seem a little counterintuitive, but we had quite a bit of rainfall in July for the state, especially around central Ohio, uh, where you see that those, those bullseye, that little bullseye of, of warmer than average conditions. This helps keep the overnight temperatures warmer than it would be if we had drier conditions because it can't escape the space that moisture absorbs that radiation and then it keeps the temperatures warmer. But during the day, it helps keep temperatures down a bit too. The other thing we had in July was a lot of wildfire smoke in our sky. So uh, that actually diffuses the energy quite a bit and it can keep your daytime highs lower because you're not, the earth isn't receiving, the land is not receiving as much direct sunlight because of that diffuse energy. So that actually kept our daytime highs cooler than average, even though our overnight lows were warmer than average. And of course, we know what happened in the fall, extreme warmth, uh, five to 10 degrees above average across the state. Again, this is when Northwest Ohio really got hit hard with rainfall, um, September, July, September in particular, but the, the wettest five or six months there for, for places like Fulton County, Lucas County, and, and over to Williams County as well. And finally, just even in, in this past December, extreme warmth. After a cold November, we had five to 10 degrees above average for the month. Uh, Cincinnati set their all time warmest Christmas day at 69 degrees. Uh, that goes back to 1871. Uh, our big five cities across, this, across the state, all in the top 10. And as a matter of fact, soil temperatures, if you checked on January 2nd, uh, we're in the mid 50s for Southern Ohio counties. And so uh, obviously things, conditions switched very rapidly after that as we got into some cold and dry weather, uh, but that just shows, you know, kind of the impact of the extremes on our conditions out there. So just to think about, you know, how did the weather of 2021 impact you and your operations? You, you know, feel free to throw that in the chat if you want to participate. Uh, a lot of you probably are familiar or, or got familiar with this this tropical species here, the fall armyworm, uh, certainly wrecked havoc in some of our, uh, you know, our, our forage fields, but also, you know, turf grass and other things like that. This is a tropical species. We see them in Ohio, but we had a tremendous amount of, you know, high numbers last year. And especially with the warm fall, we had multiple generations. And so, you know, we get curveballs and we get things that happen every year when it, when it comes to the weather. Now, as we zoom out a little bit and we think about from a climate perspective and we think about uh, the longer term changes globally, we know that we're getting warmer. 2021 is now, was, is the sixth warmest year on record going back to 1880. Uh, even more astounding is the fact that the top 10 warmest years have all occurred since 2005 and the last seven years are the warmest seven on record for the globe. So for those of you in the audience, if, if you were born after February of 1985, You've never experienced a cooler than average month for the planet. So it's been quite warm for, for quite a, a long time here. Now, why does that matter from us? And especially as we start thinking about the water and the water impact. Um, carbon dioxide evaporated water, they're greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And there's some others as well, like methane and nitrous oxide. They absorb all the energy. They absorb the energy coming off Earth's surface, keeps temperatures warmer than it would be. Think about what I mentioned last summer in July, more water vapor in the atmosphere, temperatures are warmer. And that greenhouse effect actually, you know, allows for life here on Earth as we know it, 60 degrees warmer if we didn't have these uh, particles in the atmosphere. But water vapor, even though it's very dominant greenhouse gas, it's a function of temperature. So as temperature rises, right, evaporation, the rate depends, that evaporation rate depends on the temperature of the ocean and the air. So as temperatures rise, we get stronger evaporation from our ocean, from our land. 
that extra water, quote, extra water in the atmosphere falls out within, you know, a week or two. So we set up this positive feedback, though, where we get added greenhouse gases, CO2, water vapor, atmosphere warms, it increases evaporation, the air warms further, we evaporate more moisture from the air, we elevate that moisture into the atmosphere, and then when fronts come along or systems come along, they have more water vapor in the atmosphere to act on, and we get more precipitation, heavier precipitation events, although because it's warmer, we dry the soils pretty fast at times as well. So we can get in these cycles of intense dry swing back to intense rainfall and back and forth with this intensified hydrologic cycle. So that's what we see. We've got a pretty easy equation for every 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit increase in our atmosphere. We see six to seven and a half percent increase in water vapor. We see a six to seven and a half percent increase in our heaviest rainfall events. And, and so we see the water cycle intensifying as well uh, between the amount of water evaporating and then also the precipitation that's coming down. Now, from a livestock view, we think a, a few different things here. Um, you know, when we think about the, e, the EPA's overview of U.S. greenhouse gases, mostly carbon dioxide, as I mentioned, but also methane, nitrous oxide, and some fluorinated gases. Methane emissions, and methane is much more powerful of a greenhouse gas. It's 28 times more powerful than CO2. A lot of it comes from natural gas, but also enteric fermentation, manure management, landfills, uh, and, and some other things like coal mining and, and others. And, and just to reference that here, we'll come back to, uh, you know, in general, livestock emissions and that contribution to the, to the atmosphere and what I see are, are things that the U.S. is doing that's probably leading the world in, in a lot of respects when it comes to, uh, you know, methane emissions here in the United States. <clears throat> now, if we look at two different things I'm going to do with you here in terms of the long changes here close to home. One, just look over the last, first, take the long view over the last 100, 130 years. How do conditions today compare to, say, the early part of the 20th century? And that's what you're seeing here, a difference between those two periods. We've seen warming across much of the, the United States, except for the Southeast. Um, and, and again, it's not everywhere that's warming. Parts of the Southeast have cooled. Uh, again, that feedback with water vapor in the atmosphere in particular across the Southeast and South, South Central, but also differences in our wintertime versus summer. A lot more areas see winter and spring warming and summer temperatures have been flat to even negative in some aspects across uh, a large portion of the middle part of the country. So there are seasonal differences in our, in, our dif in our changes as well. Again, summertime, it's mostly overnight lows, warmer overnight lows that are driving changes that we're seeing versus our daytime highs. If you look at the 130 year view of how precips changed, essentially we've increased about 4% since 1901. In Ohio, it's five to 15% driven strongly by fall trends. But I'm going to show you seasonal changes as well, and then also the increase in the intensity of these rainfall events and the timing, not just the intense rainfall events, but the fact that they're occurring even earlier in the year, like our Februarys and our Januarys, we're seeing a lot heavier rainfall earlier on in the season. Another way we can do this is the National Weather Service just switched their normal period. Now, this is an operational normal period. It's a 30-year window. Right now, it's 1991 to 2020. So essentially what we've done is we've chopped off the 1980s and we've added the 2010s. And we could take a difference to see just over that 40 year period by dropping the 80s from our operational normal and adding the 2010s, what's the difference? And that's what you're seeing here on the left. This is the annual mean temperature change. By just dropping the 80s and adding the 2010s, we've added about a half to one degree in our annual mean temperature here in Ohio. Note the area across the Northern Plains. It's actually cooler now that we've had the 2010s on an annual mean, and we're gonna see some seasonal differences that are, that are pretty interesting across the United States. On the right-hand side, this is the annual mean temperature uh, since 1895 for the state of Ohio. Here in Ohio and across much of the United States, the Dust Bowl era of the 1930s, 34, 37, those are where our big summertime extreme records are, are you know, um, noted. Uh, the 30s here in the United States was a particularly warm decade here in the United States, followed by this 55 to 75, a couple of decades of very cool weather. But over the last 40 years, we see that, that increase in, in, the, in the temperature you can see here on the right-hand side of the graph to where even our coolest years are still above that 20th century mean, that 1900 
1901 to, to 2000 mean. So very warm conditions that we've seen here and increasingly warm. Uh, if you look at the seasonal changes, again, in Ohio, we've seen warmer winters on average, about a degree or so. Uh, spring is a little bit unique, warmer across southern Ohio, but we've got portions of northwest Ohio uh, that have actually seen a slight cooling trend in our springtime. Summer is relatively flat as well, so some, some areas that are up, some down, but it's, it's really muted in the summertime. Again, mostly overnight wind, uh, lows that are warming, and then back to warmer falls as well. So a longer extended late, late summer into fall season, early warm up, but then this highly variable condition taking place during our springtime. So if we do the same thing for our precipitation, Right, so basically you look at this by adding the 2010s and dropping the 1980s, you can see the Eastern United States has war as, is getting wetter. The desert Southwest and the Western United States is getting drier. And again, the figure on the right shows precipitation on the annual mean, uh, the annual total precip. And, and think about that dog walking back and forth. Again, big steady increase since about mid, you know, 1964, We've seen an increase in our precipitation, a, a long increasing trend here to where even our driest years are wetter than the 20th century mean. Again, if we break it down seasonally, and this is not where it's, it, it's not the best news here, right? Uh, when we think about livestock, we think about planting and other things as well, but January winter changes, uh, big increases in precip just by switching, you know, the, the recent decades, this last decade here, very wet, wet conditions out there in wintertime, uh, spring as well. Flat trends uh, to even negative or drying trends in July and August in particular, stretching from Iowa to, through central Indiana and west central Ohio, and then back to wetter trends as we get into the fall. So unfortunately, what we've seen in terms of the weather trends are wetter winter, wetter spring, drier growing season, wetter fall. Um, and the, and the, again, that drier growing season is toward late season. Junes are still up in terms of precip, but July and August are flat to negative trends. And so we're seeing seasonal differences in, in the rainfall as well. A couple of different ways to break this down. I don't want to get too bogged down in the specifics, but we know you know, you hear about these events, one in 1,000, one in 100 year events. We know our one in 100 year events are now occurring about one every 37 years, right? So again, that doesn't mean that they only occur once every 37 years. It's a statistical number, but we know that they're increasing in frequency. We know that our heaviest rainfall is increasing as well. And so I wanted to show that a little bit here, um, a little bit differently. So I'm just taking the count of days where we see at least one inch of rain, and I've broken it down between one inch, two inch, and three inch plus uh, for every five years since 1950. And this is for Zanesville, Ohio. Um, and you can sort of see a, 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 a small trend in Zanesville. We see bigger trends across Northern Ohio, for instance. Another way we can do that is to, to break it down into the percentage of events greater than one inch. So for instance, this is what it looks like up in Northwest Ohio where they've gone from about 20% of their events occurring above the one inch threshold to 32%. So almost a 12 or 13% increase in those heaviest events. Across Southern portion and Eastern portion of Ohio, it's a little bit more muted. It's only gone up about 5% uh, over that time frame. So again, we, we see about 26, 27% of our total rainy days encompassed, you know, encompassing those greatest or heaviest rainfall events. So we know that it's getting wetter. We know the seasons are changing in terms of rainfall, and we know that the intensity is increasing. So if we look at the last, you know, if we look at the top 10 warmest years in Ohio and the top 10 wettest years, nine of the top 10 warmest years have all occurred since 1990. And we've had eight of the top 10 wettest, uh, including 18, 19, uh, 17, 18, and 19 are all in the top 10. Um, 20, 2020 was a, a little bit lower, and then last year, uh, lower still again about 29th and then 2020 was 28th but still in the top top 30 still in that that upper echelon so even our driest years are warmer than or wetter than most years that we've seen over the last 20th century so when we when we project out into the future or when we think about the changes that we're seeing i should say really should skip this to the end but um you know we're seeing our 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 climate trend toward what is a mid-Atlantic winter 
and an Arkansas summer. And I know, you know, I say that a lot in the talks that I give across the state, and it takes a minute to sink in. And when it does, um, you know, these are the types of trends, the trends that we're seeing, we're expecting in the future, which I'll show you in a second, uh, really show us that our climate's on the move, right? Our, our weather pattern is changing, uh, and it's becoming more like these states are currently as we progress in the future. So we expect, for instance, by 2050, temperatures are about three to five degrees warmer, could be as warm as eight degrees warmer by the end of the 21st century on the current track that we're on. If we look at the rainfall, we look at the precipitation, again, winter and spring precipitation increasing, shifts in jet stream, more water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, with summer dryness, uh, summer drying trends across a big portion of the United States, uh, including Ohio, Indiana, down through Tennessee, Mississippi, and points westward. Um, and then back to a wetter regime as we get into fall and again back into winter and spring. So shifts in the jet stream, changes in what our circulation patterns, leading to wet, cooler season, drier summer season, and even intensified droughts in the same year where we're setting records for rainfall. That's what we're talking about. All right, I haven't seen any questions yet. Maybe there are, and we'll do those at the end, right, Gareth? So, so what about impacts, right? And, th and this is where, you know, I've been listening around the state and, and, and engaging with, with producers and, and uh, livestock producers and, and specialty crop growers and, and just to think about different ways that you're being impacted. And I like, I like to use this slide to think about how we weigh our opportunities and our challenges, to think about those opportunities. So, you know, we know, and I'll show you, you know, longer growing seasons, longer, you know, longer seasons between our freeze dates in the winter, in, in the uh, spring and our fall. Thinking about crops and different crops that we can grow, perhaps, uh, new markets uh, opening up in the state, longer grazing periods, you know, um, perhaps reduced maintenance costs, although, you know, less winter cold versus more summer heat. You know, there's a trade-off there, for, for instance, when it comes to adequate cooling uh, versus, um, you know, with, with the maintenance cost in mind. And then opportunities to improve our soils, improve our forage quality and our feed quality. You know, thinking about those opportunities that are out there to help build resilience to the challenges that we're seeing, which are really on the right hand side. And I'll go through several of these, including heat stress on our livestock, uh, us and, and our, our, our labor as well. Thinking about food productivity, reduced quality, quality of our cereals, our grains, increased weed pressure, insects, potential disease, and then the, the impacts that come from, from more water, right? More water, uh, more mud, um, greater flood risks, health risks, um, and, and really increasing that, that risk and, and uh, challenge that we're seeing out there. So we know increasing temperatures leading to more heat stress on humans and livestock, um, uh, you know, in different areas of the country trying to mitigate that. Uh, increasing temperatures have also meant a shift in our growing zones toward the north and the west. So creating some unpredictable seasons and these extreme temperature swings. Um, as we battle, you know, basically, you know, when we think about a polar vortex, for instance, and a very cold air plunge, it's essentially because very warm air has been shunted well north into the Arctic. And that air is just a fluid and it has to spill somewhere and it can't go over the Rocky Mountains. So it just spills down into the eastern, excuse me, the eastern United States and also uh, Europe. Uh, the warmer temperatures leading to more invasive and non-native plants and animals and insects, and they typically, you know, can outpeat, outcompete some of the native species as well. Uh, native and iconic plants, you know, when I'm in Columbus, I like talking about the, the buckeye tree moving to the state up north, and that typically gets a chuckle or two. But, but thinking about things that can overwinter in Ohio and then produce, you know, thinking about pests that can produce multiple generations uh, across the region because of uh, the warming temperatures that we're seeing. Again, we are extending our growing season uh, across the Midwest. It's about nine days on average. Uh, really, in many parts of Ohio, it's closer to 15 days longer since 1970. And this is Wasi, and this is up in Northwest Ohio, looking at the, the, the season length between um, the last freeze and the first freeze at two different temperature thresholds. 
Uh, but generally across Ohio, we are on the higher side of that, you know, 10 to 15 days here. And of course, that can be beneficial, right? Longer growing season, uh, things like that. But what we're also seeing is we, we get out of the gate fast. We have warm Februarys and Marches. We talk about late freezes, but April freezes are not that late unless you're in far southern Ohio, right? Even mid-April, we see commonly see freeze conditions. Um, but if things are out of dormancy, break dormancy, uh, our trees are, are, are blooming as well. That can really you know, cause problems. And we can get disruptions and important pollinators and, and connections with, with other wildlife and, and things like that as well. On the precipitation side, again, we know what happens when we add more water, especially when we, we're not freezing the ground as often, it's not firming up, we've got more mud, we increase damage to our infrastructure, our, our floodplains, we increase health risks, of humans, livestock, and, and everything in between. We know that the intensity means more runoff and potential contamination. So we had this nice frost layer here in the surface. We got up to you know low 60s last week. We thawed the top surface, and then we put two to three inches of rain, pounding rain on top of it, right? That's spell, can spell trouble, can spell trouble. If it's an isolated event, that's one thing, but as we see an increase in these events happening, leads to more and more runoff, potential contamination, soil loss, erosion, and, and other problems that we're seeing uh, out there as well. I've been tracking uh, suitable field work days. I know Kansas State has done some work on this as well and have a nice website now. I should have posted that here. But in Ohio, if we look since 1995, suitable field work days, uh, we've lost five days in April and five days in October. Uh, that's what the trends that you're seeing here since 1995, we had a good bump up last year because of those dry conditions early on and nice warm dry fall. Uh, but in essence, we've lost 10 days of that production cycle um, with this decrease, with the increase in the rainfall uh, coupled with the wetter, basically the wetter soils that we're seeing uh, throughout the winter time and into the springtime as well. So really the question is what to do, you know, what do we, what do we do about it? And, and I would argue that every, every different, you know, audience that I speak to around the state, whether it's, you know, row crop, specialty crop, um, you know, master gardeners, livestock, uh, what we do is really comes down to a personal choice, right? It really comes down to our personal situation because when we think about one, the aspect of adaptation. We know that we've got to adapt to these changes that we're seeing, and there's no single answer. Every landowner is different, every livestock owner is different. So it really comes down to a lot of different variables, not just that it's raining more or raining heavier, but what are the values? What are your resources, the heritage, your sites, your goals and objectives of, of building resilience across your site and equipment measures and, and, and methods and things like that? I will say that there's a lot of attention right now being focused on this, and there's a great resource. First of all, the research side of the USDA is certainly starting to look really closely um, at you know, sustainable ag intensification and ag climate adaptation. These are the themes of their science over the next five years. But there's a great resource here called Adaptation Resources for Agriculture from the Midwest, the USDA Midwest Climate Hub. Um, and, and this is meant to be a workbook that, that producers and livestock owners can take and, and to think about different functions and different strategies that might help build some resilience to these things that we're seeing. Um, it can, you know, there's a lot of work still to be done to understand fully the impacts and, and how to adapt and to learn from one another. Uh, but, you know, thinking about some of these strategies, and we'll talk about a little bit of them, you know, soil and water, obviously, is fundamental what we do. Um, but how do we reduce those existing stressors on crops and livestock? How do we reduce? Um, and and I'm, I'm, you know, learning every day uh, of the adaptation that's taking place. And I'm sure I'm going to learn today as well. You know, what do we do with the mud, right? The, the increasingly muddy conditions out there that just increase the risk there, you know, certainly during certain periods of time, um, you know, how do we reduce the impacts of these extreme weather events? Uh, the heavier rainfalls? How do we manage our farms and fields as part of larger landscapes? And really, you know, thinking about different management strategies that we can incorporate or infrastructure, um, what can we do in terms of, of, of tactics here? 
when we think about conservation, you know, we're thinking about slowing progress of water from fields to streams and the quality of soil uh, all playing a role in here. You know, thinking about healthy soils, the fact that they're impacted by erosion, compaction, loss of organic matter, and, and what can we do to help build those, the, the capacity, the storage, the water storing capacity of our of fields um, to help limit some of the, the mud that we see and some of the erosion that we see as well. On the mitigation side, I, I you know, there's a lot of things that are taking place in across across the country and across the world to think about how do we also, you know, reduce our emissions. Uh, particularly, this is a little bit about livestock manure here, and um, this is just an example of, of a mitigation strategy here in terms of, of covered waste pond. Um, but I think, you know, and a lot that's been done is just in improving the food and the feed productions, right? And improving the quality, which goes a long way in terms of, of emissions. Um, a lot of different strategies are being looked at across the, the world here and across the country, but certainly biogas capture and, and use systems, flaring that or combusting the methane into essentially water and carbon dioxide, but, but how can we harness that and use it to provide heat and power as well? And again, you know, how do we collect the gas and pipe it away from our ponds and combust that methane down is, again, CO2 is a lot easier to deal, I should say, is a less of a greenhouse gas in terms of its forcing in the atmosphere versus uh, uh, methane. And if you look at, and this is a, um, um, a report from uh, the, um, i trying to remember, well, you got the link down there, there at the bottom. Uh, looking at different livestock, obviously the contribution to our current emissions, yes, about 14.5% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions do come through the livestock supply chain. So, you know, a lot of that, and you can see the, the supply chain there in the bottom right, a large portion of that is, is the enteric fermentation, uh, but also manure management. And, and I would argue uh, the, the figure on the right is, is kind of speaking to efficient practices. Uh, being the key to reducing emissions. And if you look across the world, I think the United States is in a position to lead, you know, through improving feed quality, for instance, and, and, and decreasing uh, the, the impact of those methane emissions. Um, you know, if you look at agriculture on the whole in the United States, it's about 9% of, of the pie in terms of emissions, while agriculture worldwide is about closer to 30%. You can see there's a lot of areas Africa, you know, um, Asia, and other parts of the world that can actually reduce greenhouse gases uh, even more so compared to what we see across North America. Again, improving the feed quality, the way we, we you know, um, the treat animal health, our, our manure management, and also ways of improving our energy use efficiency are all going into this. And I think this is an opportunity that livestock um, producers can continue uh, to, to build momentum here in terms of, of on the mitigation side of, of greenhouse gases. And then there are opportunities uh, that, that are coming down the pipeline. And, and certainly the USDA just announced this investment of 1 billion in climate smart commodities and to help expand markets and, and strengthen uh, rural America. And it's really about having these partnerships that can think about farms and forests and how we can curb gas emissions. Uh, so, you know, I think nutrient management and manure management is a big, a big part of this. You know, how can we execute these practices on a large scale? How can we measure and verify those impacts and really incentivize, right, the creation of these commodities in these markets so that we can incentivize producers to get involved and, and to compensate producers in a fair way? I think there's a lot of obviously un, uh, uncertainty and, and lack of transparency when it comes to things like carbon markets and um, you know, the transparency there hopefully will improve uh, through either legislation or, or other incentive programs as well. But we need you know, some mobilization on this on a large scale. And this is a, a newer opportunity just recently announced here from the USDA. All right, so that's, that's what I had really on the, on the long term. I'm gonna spend the last couple minutes here uh, may, you know, hopefully you'll have some questions here, uh, but, but just kind of the, now the short term, I kind of stopped this before at, at December, but we want to look back and see the conditions that we're, we're sitting in right now and how they're 
going to, to um, project into the upcoming spring. So back to last fall again. Again, it was the third warmest fall on record over the last 127 years, despite a colder than average November. So this is our, our average temperatures here in the middle. Uh, typically, you know, generally we were again one to four degrees above average for the fall. And it was the 35th wettest for the state. Again, very wet across Northwest counties, which skewed that upward, while Eastern counties um, were, were a bit below average, uh, especially up here in, in Northwest Wayne County, in, in this area here, Medina County as well for the fall. As we got into winter, after that warm December, got, we got cold and dry, really cold and dry for much of, of January. Uh, it was the 35th coldest January on record. Um, southern portions of Ohio for the whole winter have been running a bit above average with near to normal conditions uh, for, for central Ohio and northward. So uh, overall, still a warm, fairly warm winter despite the cold conditions that we've had here over, uh, say, the last six weeks. And that just really speaks to how warm and off the charts December was. But you'll notice the, 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 the precipitation on the right-hand side also for the winter, except for those north, north central counties that are shaded in yellow, much of the state has been above average and even running 1.25 to 1.5 times above average in that dark green area. So a lot of us have certainly seen wetter than average conditions uh, this winter. And, and what we attributed this to obviously um, is, is our weather pattern that we're seeing. Um, and what we focus and what you've probably heard a lot about are El Nino or La Nina conditions. Uh, La Nina conditions are, are what we're currently experiencing. And so if you look out into the tropical Pacific, this is Mexico here in the, in the bottom figure that you see. So top right, uh, Mexico down into uh, South America there on the right-hand side. And just to the, the west of that, across that whole expanse of area of blue shading, that's cooler than average sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific. What it does is that actually forces the polar jet stream to be highly amplified, again, pushing warm air into the Arctic, and then cold air spills down to the northern plains. What it does here across the Ohio Valley is cause wet conditions, especially as we get after the first of the year and we progress into February, March, and, and sometimes even, even beyond that. So typically wet, wetter than average, and typically warmer than average as well, but that also depends on what's happening up in the Arctic. So if you look at our recent precipitation here, this is in the bottom left, the last seven days uh, ending yesterday. Uh, again, dark green is about an inch and a half to two, and the yellow shadings are two to three inches. So we had that big system come through with quite a bit of heavy rainfall. Again, drier across north, northwest Ohio here. And over the last 30 days, Basically, the southeastern two-thirds of the state have picked up at least four inches. Now, February is our driest month of the year. Uh, we only see about two and a half to 2.8 inches of precip for the entire month on average. And yet we've got a lot of counties here across the southeast and the red and even parts of Clinton County and Warren County uh, that are pushing seven inches for the month of February already uh, with a very wet system uh, on its way, as a matter of fact. So if, you, if we look at our soil conditions, and this is the, the top 100 centimeters of our soil profile, certainly uh, top percentile ranking. So some of the you know, 90th percentile or 95th percentile in all years that we've observed um, this particular product. So very wet conditions extending from southeastern Missouri up through Southern Illinois, Indiana, and into much of Southern Ohio. It's also got our streams and rivers running quite high, so we see much above to above normal rain, uh, stream flows uh, that are expected to stay high now as we head in over the next, um, say, two weeks to, to a month period. Again, I mentioned this week we've got two big systems that are moving into Ohio. Uh, we've got a system that's going to start later on tonight and tomorrow, uh, probably going to drop one to two, maybe one, one to three inches of rainfall. Uh, for many areas along and south of I-70, lighter precipitation to the north, maybe a half to an inch of rainfall across northern Ohio. Uh, cold air is going to slip in behind that, and we're going to get another system that really rides up and over the top of that cold air, dropping heavy rainfall, uh, heavy, significant wintry precipitation, I think. Um, it'll set up somewhere across the state right now. There's some uncertainty, but you know, more rain as you head farther south in Ohio. 
more snow across our northwestern counties and in between uh, could be a transitional mess. Uh, but that could drop another one to two inches of liquid equivalent precipitation for the entire state. So again, if you look at across many counties here in southern Ohio, uh, we're looking at a good two to maybe three or four inches of rainfall, of, of, of precipitation over the next, um, say, four or five days, adding to what we've already seen in terms of the, you know, six to seven in some locations. So very, very wet conditions, especially for February. Um, so I don't, I, you know, that, that's obviously going to cause, I think, you know, a lot of you on the call a little bit of trouble uh, here this season. We do see as we head toward um, the first part of March, cooler than average conditions kind of resuming. So we've had some days in the 60s this week. Uh, we do expect temperatures to fall back probably close to or a bit below average. So highs, you know, in the 30s overnight lows in the 20s and precipitation to kind of calm down just a little bit in this eight to 14 day outlook. Again, this is, you know, basically the first week of March, a little bit of a reprieve. So things can dry out just a little bit, but the latest March outlook from the Climate Prediction Center it is showing strong indication of, of above average precipitation. You can see that on the right. This is a classic La Nina signature, very active storm pattern that brings frequent rainfall, pre frequent precipitation across the region. I'm less confident in the temperature outlook only because wet soils in the winter and the spring take a little bit longer to warm up um, because that, you know, as the sun gets higher in the sky, it's actually going into evaporating that moisture a little bit more than it is raising the temperature. So I'm a little bit less confident in the temperature outlook, but the precip outlook is, is highly confident in wetter than average conditions. Uh, we do expect this to extend uh, in, throughout our springtime, March, April, May, um, and, and some signals that we could have some pretty variable weather as we head into April and May, once again, uh, this upcoming season. And, and finally, as we look at our summer outlook, as we sit right now, and this is a very early outlook, uh, we are still leaning above average, think warmer overnight lows versus our daytime highs, but we're going to hang on to that wet signal, I think, into June uh, before we start to erode that a bit, and we'll see how much of that dry condition across the, say, the northern plains extends down into the Ohio Valley. But overall, I think it's going to be a very wet season here over the next several months, and, and so I think uh, folks should probably be preparing for that. Um, we don't really see any long-term drying trends over the next three or four months. So with that, I'll go ahead and in and the presentation today. You can always... Um, reach out my email there or at the climate.osu.edu. That's the State Climate Office website. And, you know, a little bit more optimistic figure, you know, as Garth said, we went from white to brown. Hopefully the next transition's brown to green and, and that'll, that'll get all of our spirits up just a little bit. So I appreciate your time and I'll turn it back over to Garth. Uh, once again, if you have any questions for Dr. Wilson, uh, go ahead and ask those as we kind of transition here. I guess Aaron, you know, we had that outlook meeting, you know, focused on markets, and a lot of that was driven by the drought in the West. Any thoughts on relief for those folks out there in the, in the next year, six months? Yeah, it, it's, it's, not looking, it's not looking particularly good. Um, the, the, the La Nina conditions, again, uh, tend to make the Ohio Valley a little bit, uh, a lot wetter, but as you get into the central and northern plains, um, they, they tend to see drier conditions. And so there's already a lot of talk. Um, you know, there's about 40% of the country is covered in, in drought conditions already. Uh, we really, um, you know, on our regional climate talks, there's already concern, especially the fact that much of North Dakota, South Dakota has no snow on the ground either. Well, that kind of was remedied a little bit today uh, with the system moving through. Uh, but largely, you know, they've been dealing with poor water quality up there and, and just just some big, big trouble up there from a drought perspective. Um, we don't see a lot of relief for them this season, this upcoming year. Um, so our next speaker tonight's going to be uh, Kirsten Nichols. Um, she's a Ph.D. candidate in the Department of Animal Science. Uh, going to wrap up here shortly, I believe. Um, what with her Ph.D. program and I'll let her. Uh, maybe talk a little bit more about uh, what she's done uh, during her time here at Ohio State. So, Kirsten, I'm going to turn it over to you. 
Perfect. Thanks, Garth, for the introduction. As he said, my name is Kirsten Nichols. I'm a PhD candidate. Actually, yes, finishing up soon. Um, in a couple months, I'll be finishing up. So that's exciting. Um, so today, what I'm going to be doing is kind of hopefully building on what Aaron just talked about in terms of kind of the climate outlooks and how our weather's changing. And, and from a cow-calf standpoint, how that affects our beef cows um, and heifers, first calf heifers. And, you know, just to kind of open our eyes a little bit, is in terms of net energy requirements, how big of an impact is this really having? So, at, you know, after if you were on the, the talk for Aaron's portion, um, you know, it's no surprise historically what we're used to seeing during winter time, especially with our spring calving herds here in the Midwest, where late gestation is typically, you know, December, February calving in March. What we're used to seeing is frozen ground and our precipitation coming as that snowfall which is perfect for our beef cow herds. Um, you know, as long as they're dry and out of the wind, they can withstand extremely cold temperatures. Um, but unfortunately, like Aaron was getting at, what we're becoming more accustomed to and more used to seeing here in the Midwest is like the picture I've got on the bottom right. Um, I actually took that last winter down at the research station where we just, we cannot get these cows out of mud. There's, there's no good feeding places. Um, and not only is that mud right around calving, now we're seeing that, like Aaron hinted at, we're seeing that expand and really start into late fall and really besides a few times where it freezes, especially down in Southern Ohio, um, you know, a few times that it freezes and we get some, some hard ground to deal with, but for the most part throughout most of winter and late gestation, those cows are exposed to muddy conditions. So Aaron, hopefully, um, I'm not a climatologist by any means, and your figures were a heck of a lot better than mine are, but hopefully, um, and I do think mine kind of reflect what you were saying, so I won't harp on these too much, but as he hinted at, what we're seeing is this big change in spring precipitation. And why I'm highlighting spring is, of course, because around here, most of us are spring calving herds. So what we're seeing is typically anywhere from a 10 to 15% increase in spring precipitation. And along with that, kind of what's driving that is what Aaron also hinted at was that increase in annual temperatures. So we're starting to see less of that precipitation, especially during our winter and spring months, where traditionally, you know, back in the early 1900s would come as snowfall. Now we're seeing that come as rainfall. And, you know, focusing on spring, again, we're seeing a 2 to 20 percent increase in overall precipitation and, and also in that spring precipitation, which is what's impacting the cow herd dramatically. So if we start thinking about from a cow standpoint, or even from whether you want to think about it from a feedlot standpoint, um, I kind of focused on the cow herd just because around here, of course, we're more cow-calf driven. But if we start thinking about this new type of environment that these cattle are exposed to, there's a lot of things we haven't had to consider in the past that we really need to start shifting our mindset a little bit and try wrapping our head around that. One would be maintenance requirements. Um, those are especially going to change when those cattle are exposed to different climatic factors that aren't, aren't just your traditional cold stress or heat stress anymore. Um, you know, in terms of mud, what kind of stress is it? Is it simply a cold stress? I mean, it is acting as a heat sink, but is it a behavioral stressor? Um, in terms of just locomotion, is it harder for those cattle to walk through mud? Of course it is. So just things like that that are going to impact maintenance requirements. Of course, if requirements are being affected, and this is kind of shifting more towards the feedlot sector, but that is dramatically going to affect things like feed efficiency, the days on feed, feed intake. Um, I already hinted at behavior, and actually from a cow-calf standpoint where we're seeing there's no real hard data to prove this, but just you know, being on farm, what we're seeing is just what I've shown in this picture on the left, where those cows do not want to leave. You know, They may have a spot where they can get out of the mud, but those cows, unfortunately, they want to stay close to feed and water. So they're kind of dramatizing the issue even more because they won't leave those, those, pet, those feed pads. Um, fetal programming is an issue, especially when we focus on the cow herd and she's entering late gestation, which I'll get into in a few slides, the net energy requirements throughout gestation. But if that cow is stressed, um, if she's being nutrient restricted throughout late gestation, there's a lot of work to show that there are fetal programming effects from that um, kind of adverse intrauterine environment that she's enduring. Fifth would be welfare. So thinking about animal well-being, of course, when we're trying to grow consumer trust and, and want them to feel confident in their, our product, 
naturally seeing cattle out in pastures like this is, is not good for kind of the beef industry image from one standpoint, but also when we start thinking about um, claw and hoof health in terms of locomotion scores, things like that. And then Aaron kind of hit it at this, this piece of it that we need to consider too is from a sustainability standpoint, pasture regrowth, um, our forage utilization. If we keep putting this hard pressure on our pastures year after year after year, um, you know, we're gonna start seeing things like more erosion and more runoff. We're going to really kind of hinder when we start to get into the carpet market talk, our carbon sequestration is going to suffer. So there's a lot of things that we need to start considering moving forward, realizing that this is, like he said, this is kind of our new normal. So how do we deal with that? So for today, I'm going to focus on maintenance requirements of the cow herd and then a little bit of fetal programming effects and kind of what we've seen from that standpoint. So starting off that conversation with the net energy requirements um, and, and thinking about fetal growth with our cow herd, it's important to think about what that cow is going through physiologically really about now when she's in late gestation, um, depending on when you calve, it, you might be a little bit too late um, to kind of impact this, but if you're not calving till April, you've got a few months to kind of turn things around. But if we think about it, um, the last trimester of our, our spring calving herds here in the Midwest is like I said, those late winter and early spring months. And if we look to this figure I've got here on the right, this is the first study back in the 90s to look at fetal growth. And I'm sorry, this is in kilograms. I didn't convert it, but this would be about a 70, 80 pound uh, calf. And they did a serial slaughter throughout every week of gestation to really look at that growth trajectory of that fetus. And we'll focus on the one with the squares. Those are boss Taurus cows. The ones in the circles are boss Indicus. But what we really see is during that last trimester, that last third of gestation, is that rapid exponential growth of that fetus. And of course, that translates to a similar increase in that cow's nutrient requirements. So before we get any further, I wanted to take a minute because I don't, not many people, I guess, really acknowledge what's going on physiologically in terms of net energy, crude protein, and requirements of a beef cow throughout a whole production year. So I just made this figure um, and this is making some assumptions, of course, this is going to change depending on what breed, um, you know, typically what frame scores, what your mature cow weight is, things like that. But just for reference, this is for an average 1200 pound Angus cow with an eight, 18 pound uh, peak milk, which is pretty average for an Angus cow. And just for reference, I put down at the bottom, um, these are on average, one pound of corn is equal to about 1.6 megacalories of net energy on the net energy system. And one pound of corn silage is equal to about 1.1 to 1.2 megacalories. So just to kind of keep that in the back of your mind, depending on you know, what you typically feed your cow herd, and if you even know what your net energy is of your hay or things like that, um, just to think about, am I, with what these requirements are, am I close to meeting that? Do I know if I'm meeting that? Things to keep in the back of our minds. But this figure that I've got starts on the x-axis at day zero. So this would be day of the year relative to calving. So Assuming that calving starts on day zero um, is an assumption I made as well. And if we look at this figure, the dotted line I've got here is net energy for maintenance. So if we think about our spring calving cows, though, um, especially a mature cow, around here we expect our cows to be on yearly calving intervals. So if we think about that, she really, if calving is on day zero, and say she should rebreed 80 to 90 days after calving, that cow really is never at a true maintenance where all she has to do is worry about herself and maintain herself. She's always either lactating or gestating. And actually, if we, if we think about this timing here with breeding being 80 or 90 days after uh, her first calf hits the ground, she's actually overlapping and, and lactating and gestating at the same time. So just for reference, I wanted to talk a little bit about when her greatest uh, nutrient requirement in terms of energy is, and that would be at peak lactation. So she's requiring about 14.5 megacalories per day at peak lactation. Of course, as we think that cow after she hits peak starts to dry off eventually all the way to weaning, her net energy requirements reflect that and decrease until we get to weaning, which I put that at about 205 days on average. Um, and we still see though that her net energy requirements are just a little bit above that maintenance line. And that would be in the first, still in the first trimester, entering the second trimester of gestation, where those gestational requirements are essentially zero. They're very, very minimal. 
And that's why when we say if we need to put condition on a cow at the weaning, when her requirements are at their lowest, that's a good time to take advantage of that and put weight on that cow. But then as I just showed with that fetal growth curve, we see this rapid exponential growth towards that last third of gestation. And relating that back to the climate um, that we've talked about, that's when those cows are experiencing that mud stress. So right before calving is where she experiences her second greatest net energy requirement, which is about 13.7 megacalories per day. Now transitioning a little bit though and thinking about that's the mature cow, what happens with first calf heifers? And I didn't model this for a whole production year. I just focused on gestation. So in this figure, I've assumed again, a 1200 pound mature weight. And based on, I've got down here, the NASEM 2016, that's kind of our guide, guidebook of beef cattle nutrition. A lot of research has gone into making the recommendation that at conception, our boss Taurus heifers should weigh about 60% of their mature weight. By first calving, they should weigh about 80%. So that'd be about 960 pounds on a 1200 pound mature weight. So basically what that heifer has to do, and if we look at all these different lines I've got going here on this figure, um, this bottom line is the gestation requirement. So very similar um, to the mature cow, probably a little bit less if we compared those two curves to each other, just because typically for first calf heifers, we're gonna be selecting for calving ease, lower birth weights, things like that. So not as big of a fetus that she needs to grow. However, though, if you look at this next line, this kind of dotted line, that is the net energy for growth. So as I just hinted at, that heifer is clearly not at mature weight. She's trying to hit that target of 80% mature weight. So she actually has an increasing requirement for growth as gestation progresses. So naturally, as she's growing and she's getting heavier, getting closer to that 80% of mature weight, her net energy for maintenance is going to slowly increase as well. She's got more body, more pounds of body to maintain. So that net energy requirement is going to increase as well. And if we put all three of those together and look at the top curve here, that would be her net energy for growth, for maintenance, and for gestation. And we see that that's just about four and a half to five, depending on you know, what type of heifer you're dealing with, megacalories per day greater than what would be for a mature cow. So if we switch our, our kind of train of thought here and think about maternal nutrient restriction, so say we aren't meeting those nutrient requirements, this actually is pretty common in our spring calving herds, especially in the Midwest. As I mentioned, they have, they're experiencing those increasing nutrient requirements during late gestation. And just nature of the beast with where we are in the country um, and the timing of our calving, they're often exposed to poor forage quantity and quality at the same time. Of course, our pastures are dormant. The last couple of years, not necessarily this last year, but a couple of years before that, we really struggled with getting quality hay to those cows. And then on top of those two stressors, now we're throwing mud into the mix. Um, and if we think about late gestation energy restriction specifically, of course, it's going to result in a loss of empty body weight. But we can start to see some, some more pronounced issues getting into things like decreased birth weight of our calves, which can increase um, sickness and morbidity in those calves right off the bat. We can see decreased pregnancy rates in the long run, um, increased postpartum and estrus intervals, so prolonging the period for that cow to get bred, possibly throwing her out of that yearly calving cycle. So a lot of issues that we need to start thinking about and taking maternal nutrient restriction more seriously, um, especially when we're throwing, like I said, mud into the mix. And there's a couple of quotes that I've, I've read over the last couple of years that have really stuck in my mind when we start thinking about environmental effects on cattle production and, and mud specifically. And the first one is while mud alone can reduce, or excuse me, while cold stress alone can reduce profits, it's most detrimental when combined with mud. Um, and I've had a lot of questions of, well, what's so special about mud? Why is it worse than cold stress? Or why is it worse than heat stress? Um, and it just has to do with the fact that moisture on that hair reduces that, that cow or that steer, that heifer's external insulation. And there's been a lot of work done. This is back in the 80s and 90s where animals were either wet or they were dry, but they were kept at the same ambient temperature. And those animals that were wet, but at that same temperature had greater metabolic rates versus the, the dry animals. So it just really has a lot to do with that temperature regulation. And that's really what's driving in terms of the mud, you know, there is a behavioral issue to it, but 
in my opinion, what's really driving that goes back to a basal metabolic rate and really maintaining that temperature of that beef cow. So naturally with, with all of these issues that we've been having and when I started my PhD, I really wanted to do some research that had an impact on producers in Ohio and what producers were dealing with. And mud, in my mind, is one of the number one issues that we deal with. So my question was, okay, so what about the cow herd? How do we feed the cow herd? What are the net energy requirements of the cow herd in terms of when they're exposed to mud during late gestation? So the first experiment that we did was with mature cows. And with this, we took 16 uh, mature Angus-based cows down at the Eastern Ag Research Center. They were about seven years of age, and um, this is again in kilograms, so I apologize, but about 1,200 pounds mature weight. And on the first day of our experiment, we took those cows and we ranked them from the heaviest to the lightest and basically put them into eight body weight pairs to make our body weight pairs as similar as they could possibly be um, that we could create at that farm. Um, and they all had an expected calving date of March 23rd, 2020. So that ensured that those cows, they were all AI'd, ensured that all those cows were at the exact same day of gestation. So for our materials and methods then, we took one cow from each pair and randomly assigned her to one of our two treatments. The first being the mud treatment, where those cows were housed in about 10 inches of mud on average from day 213 to day 269 of gestation. And then naturally the second cow of that, that body weight pair was put into our control treatment where cows were housed in wood chips, um, just a bark bedding with a little bit of sawdust from day 213 to day 269 of gestation. So this really allowed us with the pair feeding um, to kind of create it so that mud was truly the only stressor that was different. So they were exposed to the exact same climatic elements, the same you know, rainfall, the same temperature, everything was the same except for that mud treatment. So all of our cows were housed and fed individually. That allowed us from a statistical standpoint to get true replication, which I won't get into that. But really the, the upside of housing cows individually is we could get true dry matter intakes on those cows and, and really break that down and relate that back to net energy requirements. So all of our cows were fed the same diet once a day that was formulated to meet that control cow's maintenance and gestation requirements that was based on her body weight. So every week we went in and we weighed those cows to make sure that we were hitting the right maintenance requirements. And then I adjusted, depending on that fetal growth curve, adjusted her gestational requirements, depending on what week of gestation all of those cows were entering. So that allowed that each pair received that same dry matter allowance throughout the treatment period. So like I said, gave us a really good idea of what those cows were consuming and how to relate that back with mud as the true only difference between those two groups of cows how do we relate that back to a net energy requirement? So starting off with some results, we'll look first at cow body weight and on the x-axis, all my figures will be the same with day of gestation um, on the x-axis. This is in kilograms, but I tried to highlight kind of the main body weights and convert those to pounds to make it a little bit easier for us Americans that hate the metric system. Um, but starting off on day 213 of gestation, we see those two treatment groups started at statistically similar body weights, about 1,200 pounds. Um, we did switch those cows from an ad libitum hay diet at the research station to, since we're feeding these cows every day individually, a higher concentrate, more energy dense diet. So we see these body weight losses in the first couple weeks um, of that treatment period, but we're attributing that to just gut fill loss as they uh, transition to a completely different diet. But what's important is if you look from day 241 onwards of gestation, and you see those control cows start to increase their body weight, which you would expect because they're growing that fetus. We remember back to that exponential fetal growth curve. She should be increasing her body weight during late gestation as that fetus grows. But if we look at those mud cows, they hung right around 460 kilograms, so about 1,020 pounds, um, and really only maintain that body weight. And by the end of the treatment period, we see an 83 pound difference between those two treatment groups. But the interesting part, even though we see this dramatic um, spread in body weight, is that those mud cows were consuming the same amount and the same diet um, as those control cows were. So then we think about, okay, so if these cows are not, in, the mud cows are not increasing their body weight, 
but they are still growing a fetus, what's going on in terms of conceptus free live weight? So basically just taking that maternal weight and removing the gravid uterus from the equation, a mature cow should be able to maintain that weight. That would be her typical 1200 pound mature weight that she should be able to maintain. So as I said, um, you know, they started a little bit less. I started this regression, actually I took the first two weeks of the study out to eliminate that adjustment to the new diet. Um, so they're a little under 1200 pounds, um, which is pretty typical though, when we think about gut fill loss and shrinkage of intestines and things like that, that will, will happen when you transition to a higher concentrate diet. But what we did is we put a linear regression to this. So basically from day 227 to 269, we looked at the slope coefficient. So this, this minus point, we'll round it up, say minus 0.3 kilograms per week is telling us that those control cows lost 0.3 kilograms per week on average. Um, now that's pretty minimal. We're considering that pretty much that those cows were able to maintain that conceptus free live weight. That could be just a difference in scales on a certain day or you know, cows drank water before they came in. So that's pretty minimal. But if we look down at these mud cows and we look at their regression coefficient, we see they lost about 5.3 kilograms per week on average. So if we look at this over time, they lost, they went from 969 pounds all the way down to 885 pounds of gut conceptus free weight. Again, assuming fetal growth was the same, we still see that 83 pound difference. What's notable there though, again, is that they consume the same amount of feed as those control cows. So then next we recorded body condition score um, every week that we were there. Those cows in both groups started at about a body condition score of four, um, a little bit thin. Makes sense though. They were, you know, we're talking about these kind of stressful conditions that we brought those cows in. It was late, well, like middle of January. So they were exposed to those muddy conditions before we even brought them in. Um, those, those cows in the control group actually increased their body weight. Um, that just kind of confirms, yes, we were meeting those requirements. That confirms that, yes, they were able to maintain that conceptus free live weight because they actually increase their body condition scores. Versus if we look at the mud cows, they started at a four and they dropped to about a 3.5 on average by the end of the treatment period. So about two weeks before gestation, or excuse me, before parturition. So now the interesting part is if we look at cow body weight at parturition, so at calving, um, those mud cows still did weigh numerically less and we ended up pulling them out two weeks before their due dates just because we didn't want those cows having those calves in the individual pens and in those mud pens. So we did still see a difference there between cow body weight. Um, gestation length, however, was not different. Numerically, those cows in the mud treatment decreased their gestation length by about two days, so calved about two days sooner, but not statistically significant. And the most interesting part to me was even though there was an 83 pound difference in body weight by the end of that treatment period, calf birth weight was not affected. Um, really interesting finding. That was not what we were expecting to find at all. And then even more interesting was looking at calf weaning weight. So we followed those calves all the way up to weaning. Um, about a 10 pound difference between that those mud calves weighed less than the control calves. But when we put stats to it, it really was not significantly different. And then similar finding with the cow body weight at weaning. Those cows actually were pretty much able to gain that weight back over the summer. Um, we did provide them some hay until grass came in and they had good grass. But you know, really, we didn't supplement those cows anything special, and they were able to increase their body weights and catch back up with those control cows. So when we start thinking about, okay, so all this data together, like I said, we, we should be able to put an energetic cost to that mud stressor. And I won't go through all of the math, but basically what that boils down to um, and, and what we were able to find is that that mud is equivalent to about 3.9 megacalories per day for mature cows. So increasing their net energy requirements by about 40%. So our next question after we completed this study with the mature cows was, okay, so we know that heifers requirements are much different throughout late gestation than, than the mature cow herd. So will that, that net energy cost of mud be the same for those first calf heifers? So our second experiment was with first calf heifers. Um, we increased our sample size to 18 first calf heifers this time. 
They were AI bred similar to the cows, um, targeted to calve right at about two years of age. We did the similar um, experimental design where we took those heifers and ranked them from heaviest to lightest and, and created those body weight pairs. And similar to the cows, we took one heifer from each pair and put one in the mud treatment. This time the heifers were housed in about eight inches of mud on average from day 196 to 266 of gestation. So we increased that length um, from 56 days to 70 days for the heifers. And then of course the other heifer from that, that body weight pair was put in our control treatment. So this time around, um, we actually gave them a two week dietary adjustment period from day 182 to 196 when we moved them into their individual pens to kind of eliminate that decrease in body weight that we saw with the cows, let them get adjusted, um, get, let their GI tract adjust to that diet so we don't see kind of these artificial body weight losses. But again, our heifers were all housed and fed individually, fed the same diet once a day. And that was formulated to meet that control heifer's maintenance for that week, depending on her body weight, her growth requirements, and her gestation requirements. And again, like I said, we adjusted that weekly, and that provided, similar to the cow study, that each pair received the same dry matter allowance throughout that entire 70-day treatment period. So starting off with heifer body weight, um, this is set up similar to how it was with the cow study, where we selected heifers that were as similar as we could possibly get them, um, that had this, the same AI, AI date. And it just happened, I got lucky and got some heifers that were really similar and each treatment group on average weighed 969 pounds. As we follow them through gestation, we see these control heifers start to increase their body weight as you would expect as that fetus grows um, towards late gestation. And then if we look at the control, or excuse me, the mud heifers, we see a similar trend as what we did with the, the mud cows where they decreased their body weight and actually ended a little bit bigger difference here, 96 pounds lighter than those control heifers. And again, similar to the cow study, even though there's that significant body weight difference, they were consuming the same amount of feed every day of gestation. So we wanted to look again to conceptus free live weight. So without that growing fetus in, in the equation, what does that true heifer body weight look like? And when we think about what's a heifer's job during um, gestation, even if we take that fetus out, she should still be growing to reach that 80% of her mature weight by first calving. So if we put again a regression to this and we look at average weight loss over that treatment period, we saw that our control heifers actually lost 2.1 kilograms per week, about four, four pounds, four to five pounds per week on average. Um, what we're really attributing that to is if you look here at their, their starting weight at 921 pounds, that's actually still just about at their 80% of their mature weight actually at the start of our treatment period. So they still had to get all the way to day 280 before they should have been reaching their 80% mature weight. So we think that's what's happening there is, you know, when you formulate and your growth requirements are essentially actually telling you that they need to decrease their body weights to hit that 80% target, um, which we didn't do that. We made growth essentially minimal, gaining, you know, 100 grams a day or whatever. Um, but we think that's the reasoning why those heifers lost that body weight. But what's more interesting is when we look at these mud heifers. And if you look at their regression coefficient, it's minus 6.8 kilograms per week. So again, we see that 96 pound difference um, by day 266 of gestation. Again, even though they were consuming the exact same amount of feed. And if we look at heifer body condition score, um, this tells a lot. These heifers um, started in very good body condition, which you would want for first calf heifers, um, but very, very fleshy. Those heifers in the control treatment were able to maintain about a six and a half body condition score, uh, whereas those heifers in the, in the mud treatment actually decreased and ended at about a 4.5, so pretty thin by calving for first calf heifers. So similar um, as the cow study, we pulled those heifers out two weeks before their expected due dates because we didn't want them calving in those pens. However, with these first calf heifers, we did see a difference um, when heifer body weight at calving, where those mud heifers only weighed about 845 pounds and those control heifers weighed about 911 pounds. 
If we look at gestation day uh, or gestation length in days, we see a numerical decrease um, by about three days where those mud heifers calved earlier. However, the interesting part is when we think about those calves, you know, in utero or gaining about a pound a day, we would have thought we would have seen um, a significant decrease in calf birth weight because those cows were calving sooner, but we really didn't see that. I mean, numerically a decrease, but we were targeting about a 70 pound birth weight and we were formulating those nutrient requirements. So really um, surprising finding there that again, even with these heifers, even though we saw that almost a hundred pound difference between our controls and our mud heifers, we didn't see a decrease in calf birth weight that was significantly different. And then similar to the cow study, we followed those calves all the way to weaning. And this was again, a surprising find where yes, those mud calves were numerically 10 pounds lighter, but when you put stats to it, it wasn't even close to being significantly different. And then similar to the cow study, again, those heifers body weight at weaning was not different. So really showing that those heifers were able to increase their body weights um, after, after calving and, and did decrease, increase to about the control heifer body weight. And remembering back to that target where I said heifers should be roughly 80% of their mature weight at that first calving, thinking about what did our controls and our mud heifers meet that, our controls were about 76% of their mature weight um, versus only 70% of their mature weight in our mud heifers. So you know, we can argue that, and I haven't run any stats or anything on that, but I would say 76% to 80% would not be different. Um, you know, that could be air and scales and things like that. But if you think you're only reaching 70% of mature weight, um, that's a pretty significant loss in body weight in those heifers. So just interesting, when we start putting this calf data together, and this is kind of getting into the fetal programming effects that I talked about, um, as I mentioned, you know, we, this was with the cow study, we couldn't go weigh them after birth, um, because of some COVID-19 restrictions in the university. This was back in 2020. When we pick up about the middle of May and we weigh those calves every single week until weaning, those, those dots are almost identical, almost on top of each other. So really no differences at all in terms of calf body weight all the way up to weaning. And then similar in our heifer study, um, again, recording birth weights and then weights every single week up until weaning, we see a really similar finding where those body weights of those control calves and those mud calves were almost identical. And then in the heifer study, we didn't get a chance because of those COVID restrictions with the cows, but with the heifers, we were able to collect plasma samples within 24 to 48 hours after birth. So this would be their, their um, day one mark, where we, we knew that they had nursed, they should have plasma IgGs in their system. That was a way for us to kind of gauge colostrum quality without actually having to milk out those heifers. And we recorded that every seven days until 28 days after birth, thinking that at least we, if we didn't see a difference in calf birth weight, maybe we'd see a difference in colostrum quality showing up in calf plasma IgG. We again, you know, did not see what we thought we would see. We did not see a significant difference between calf plasma IgGs between either of our two treatment groups. So again, I'm not gonna go through the math, but putting an actual energy value to mud for the first calf heifers, we found out that this is actually increased from 3.9 for those the mature cows to about 5.1 megacalories per day for first calf heifers. So if we start to think about, okay, we've got this energetic cost, um, it's an increase in net energy requirements by 3.9 and 5.1 megacalories per day, how much feed would it cost to meet that? And this is a table I put together um, the beginning of this year, and I understand these feed costs are going to be a little outdated because my only option really was to take um, averages from 2016 to 2021, and that comes from USDA. But what I want you to focus on is just the amount to be fed, and this is just for the mature cows to meet that 3.9 megacalories per day, how much of several of these feed ingredients would I need to feed to, to hit that? So basically, if you're going to feed corn, you'd have to feed two and a half pounds per day to meet that extra 3.9 megacalories per day. And that's making the assumption that you are meeting her requirements up to that point. 
So in terms of, you know, we kind of preach on the beef team, forage test, um, understand your nutritional quality of your feeds. That's a, making that assumption that yes, we are meeting her requirements besides that extra stressor of mud. So with corn, like I said, you need to feed about two and a half pounds per day. Alfalfa meal or an alfalfa cube would actually be almost five pounds per day you'd need to supplement. Corn gluten meal would be about two and a half pounds. Distillers grains would only be about 2.3. Soybean meal would be 2.7 and corn gluten feed would be 2.6 pounds. And focusing more on what it would cost a supplement on a dollars per day, and this would be per head. So, you know, you'd have to multiply this by how many cows you've got, but the cheapest option would actually be corn gluten feed to, to supply that extra energy that that cow needs. And like I said, I put caution to this table because these feed costs are a little bit outdated, and especially with what feed costs are right now, these are probably gonna be a little bit higher and may switch what, what would be the most economically advantageous to supplement. Um, so really just depends on what area you're in and what you have available to you, but just something you, you really need to put numbers to and think about when we, when we see how big of an energy requirement that extra mud has on those cows. And a lot of people have asked, okay, so you, you found Yes, it increases net energy requirements pretty significantly, about 40% in mature cows. And actually, um, that increase in heifers is closer to 50 or 55% of their net energy requirements per day. But you didn't see any differences in calf birth weight. You didn't see any differences in calf IDG. Um, growth up to weaning wasn't affected. So do I really need to supplement my cows? And what I caution, and this is making some assumptions, so I'll explain this. This is looking at conceptus free live weight, and this is in kilograms, so I apologize, but looking at days relative to calving, if we model that over several years, and what happens if you say, okay, I'm not gonna supplement my cows, this is also making the assumption that she never gains that body weight back and that we don't supplement, say, at weaning, um, or that she doesn't gain any weight back in summer when hopefully we have some good, better grass, better forage. Um, this is making those assumptions, but if we if we assume that you know day zero would be calving, this solid black line would be that 550. So basically, that 1,200 pounds of mature weight that she should be able to maintain if we're helping her meet those energy requirements. That would be a body condition score of a six. If we assume she hits that those last 70 days of gestation and decreases her body weight, like what we've seen on average in our cow study that we did um, back in 2020, that would put her down just a little over 500 kilograms, so about a thousand pounds, a um, little over a thousand pounds. That would drop her from a six to actually just below body condition score of a five, and she would actually be a body condition score four, a high four. We make the assumption she maintains that body weight for the rest of the year. By the calving of year two, we hit late gestation. She's exposed to those muddy conditions again, and she decreases her body weight again. She's actually dropping now from a body condition score of a four to a high three. Um, and if she does that again for a third consecutive year, she's actually dropping her body condition score to a two. So if we think about that from a reproduction standpoint, um, there's a study back in 1995 that is cited heavily where they looked at different body condition scores and what pregnancy rates they saw. And body condition scores of six by 60 days into the breeding season, 96% of those cows were pregnant. When they dropped that down to a body condition score of five, pregnancy rate dropped to only 80% of those cows being pregnant. And then the lowest body condition score they looked at was a body condition score of four, where only 56% of those cows were pregnant by day 60 of the breeding season. So my question and my caution is if we keep subjecting those cows to that body weight cycling, um, and I know this is a harsher example because like I said, they're not ever gaining that body weight back or even gaining some of that body weight back. My, my caution is if we keep subjecting those cows to that type of environmental stressor, we don't help her get through it either nutritionally or you know, look at other options like putting in a feed pad or some other way to get them out of mud is that after several years of this by maybe year three, maybe year four, we're gonna get into kind of a red zone where we decrease reproduction. We are probably gonna start seeing um, back in year two, we're gonna start seeing decreases in calf birth weight. We're gonna see consequences on colostrum quality and things like that that are really gonna get us into some issues from a cow, a cow just production standpoint, what we expect of those cows, but also some fetal programming effects that we didn't see 
um, in these studies because those cows started in good condition. But if those cows don't start in as good a condition, I think we'll see a lot more detrimental consequences of that mud stress and late gestation. So the main conclusions from the studies that we've done over the last couple of years is again, that that energetic cost of mud to the mature beef cow is 3.9 megacalories per day. And that increases to 5.1 megacalories per day for the first calf heifer. As I kind of just hinted at, the cows and the heifers in our studies were in really good condition at the start. So we think they were in good enough condition. So body condition scores of, you know, a five to a six, and they were able to mobilize those body stores to provide for fetal growth. So um, I didn't put it in this presentation, but we um, ultrasounded for back fat, um, for rump fat, and did some plasma metabolites to see where was the, the mobilization coming from? Was it skeletal muscle? Was it just strictly fat mobilization? And we did have some confirmation that they were mobilizing their fat stores. Um, so it's pretty obvious that cows and heifers put fetal growth at the top of their list in terms of priorities for nutrient requirements, and they will mobilize whatever they can to provide for that fetal growth. As I just hinted out as well, though, while we didn't see any adverse effects on calf birth weight, I mentioned the calf IgG from the heifers um, or calf growth up to weaning in either of those studies, we really caution letting those cows and heifers decrease that conceptus free live weight during late gestation. And why I say that is going back to that last figure I just showed, where if we see um, conceptus free live weight losses year after year, or maybe those heifers never quite reach their mature weight, we, I really think we're gonna start seeing a lot of negative um, effects in terms of reproduction, in terms of milk yield, calf growth, um, a lot of kind of alternative fetal programming effects that can occur in utero if that cow doesn't have enough energy to fully develop that calf and develop important systems like you know the, the glucose and the insulin systems, things like that that will affect calf efficiency and growth later on in the feedlot. I think we really need to avoid that or we will start seeing those negative effects. So with that, I'll wrap up my portion and Garth, I think um, seems like there's some chat, so I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, feel free if anyone has any questions, that's my email, just like Aaron put up, um, but I guess I'll stop sharing and then we can, oops. Yeah, it looks like a question from Stan. Uh, did you follow either of the groups through rebreeding or days return to estrus uh, to see if there were any differences in breed back? Yeah, so the, the cow study, we didn't because of COVID. The plan was to keep pulling blood samples every week until we put them in effects time AI protocol to look at progesterone concentrations and then look at pregnancy rates. But with COVID, we couldn't. Uh, we did do that with the heifers, though. And really interesting, and Alvaro can, can kind of talk more about this, but he didn't really give me a straight answer. I actually, I did that. I did what I just said. I took blood samples actually every single week until... June 1st, and we put them in that fixed time protocol. And out of the 18 heifers that I followed, we only had one that had progesterone greater than one nanogram per milliliter, which is kind of our cutoff of saying they're cycling or they're not. Um, so kind of a weird finding, because like I said, those heifers after calving were all in really good condition. Um, they were supplemented like Eastern usually does until good grass comes in and then we didn't need to. But Really interesting that we had, we really struggled with reproduction after calving with heifers in general. And I know they they saw that in kind of all of their heifers this year. So in terms of why that was, I'm not sure. Um, Alvaro couldn't even really give me a good response to that. But in terms of treatment differences between our mud and our controls, no, we, we did not see a difference between heifer cycling or um, days to resume estrus or anything like that. You know, what you showed was uh, really no difference in the weight of that calf um, at birth, you know, and we've all been taught it and we've all taught it, you know, that hierarchy and nutrient use, you know, that maintenance is first and foremost, that really didn't seem to be the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was, especially with the heifers, that's what we really wanted to look at is a mature cow that has those body reserves, she's already at her mature weight, makes sense that she would be able to prioritize fetal growth a little bit more than maintenance. Um, you know, and we're lucky we don't have super harsh summers and things like that. But like in Australia, I mean, those cows, 
when you see them, they are when I guess really in you know the, the southwestern US, you see that, especially in drought conditions, where those mature cows are able to mobilize their body stores and they get pretty darn thin to be able to provide for that calf. But with a first calf heifer, we question that. No one's really looked at that in terms of the nutrient hierarchy that you're talking about. And I think it's pretty evident that as long as they're in good condition early on in that, that last trimester, they will mobilize body conditions to, to be able to supply for that fetal growth. My question though, and, and this is kind of just how Wayne manages those heifers there, he gets them pretty heavy early on. And my question is, okay, so if you're, if you're just trying to hit that 80% and you're trying to hit kind of a steady growth throughout late gestation and those heifers aren't as fat, would they be able to do that? I'm not sure. With the heifers that we used, yes, they did prioritize fetal growth and they had the body stores that they were able to mobilize to provide for that. Um, I guess I just, I see a question come in. Do you have recommendations for a feed pad? Um, so this actually, if I had more time here, is a really good question because the next study I think that needs to be done or one of the studies that needs to be done is an economic modeling project in terms of a feed pad, like a concrete pad, um, a geotextile pad. At Eastern, they do kind of what I showed pictures of where they just call it a sacrifice pasture and that's what they feed on and they acknowledge that it's gonna get torn up, but kind of keep them out of there the next spring, reseed it if we need to. I think what needs to be done is looking at economically what's most efficient, but then also from a pasture regrowth you know, what's sufficient from that standpoint, there's a lot of different angles you could take it. We're talking sustainability in terms of, um, like I said, water runoff and erosion, things like that. So in terms of recommendations and Stan and Garth, feel free to jump in here. But I guess my opinions are that everybody kind of preaches the geotextile pads, which they are better than nothing, in my opinion. But there is a lot of upkeep that people don't think about when you put in a geotextile pad in terms of the wear and tear on the pad, cow behavior, which there's no really work to show this, but again, just from experience, it seems like those cows don't want to leave that feed pad. So, you know, you're creating a feed pad, you do a textile pad to help with that problem, but you, it's hard to scrape. It's a lot of extra labor. Um, each year, you've got to add more stone into that feed pad. So I think there's pros and cons to both. Do I think it's, it's any better than doing nothing? Yes, I think it's better than doing nothing. Um, but I guess you guys jump in if you have any opinions on that, but that's kind of my opinion and where I see future work going is looking into the economics of those systems over time. Yeah, you know, I, I've seen the local NRCS office kind of go away from the geotextile to the concrete in large part due to the lifespan of that pad uh, and the maintenance. You know, the, the, the key with having a pad is you still got to scrape the manure and uh, and mud off of it, right? Or otherwise you've got just a concrete or gravel base and you're still fighting yep. the, the mud and the slop. Um, uh, we've got a fact sheet that we've been looking for on this topic um, as far as design and, you know, if you got X amount of cows, how many square feet do you have kind of thing. Um, but in RCS, uh, is another really good resource or soil and water um, as far as uh, designing a, a feeding facility, a feed pad. Kirsten, I, I share your concern with the maintenance on feeding pads. I've seen them go to pot pretty quick. I, I, I would love to see an economic analysis on which is the best way to go. But it, it's interesting with what Aaron talked about and what you're sharing tonight. About 10, 12, 13 years ago, we did a program with John Grimes down in Highland County. And we posed the question then, is it time in Ohio to start thinking about uh, getting cows under a roof in the winter? And the expense of that is tremendous, especially uh, if you've got a bunch of cows, but um, somebody needs to do an economic analysis of that. There's no question that it costs us money when they're out in the mud. Yep, absolutely. Um, 
Um, certainly appreciate everybody logging on uh, here tonight. Don't forget, in the month of March, we're going to talk about animal health uh, from a vaccination standpoint, Dr. Justin Kiefer. Uh, he's also going to cover a little bit on uh, anaplasmosis. I went through and seen if there were any questions asked for the April, April session. Um, and I'm going to shoot one of them to Dr. Kiefer as well. Uh, they were on along the lines of yonis and managing yonis. So that'll be a great question for Dr. Kiefer um, a month from today, March 21st, uh, six o'clock. 